for, for the day, uh, Michael Seaton, uh, based at SCFC Dosby Laboratory in the UK. And, and today is on biomolecular simulations with molecular dynamics. Uh, uh, and I believe we've got our first two lecturers in, in already. So uh, our first lecturer today is Professor Anela Ivanova. Uh, who is based at the Faculty of Chemistry and Pharmacy at Sophia University. Uh, and I believe you're, uh, I believe the, the talk is going to be on the basics of molecular dynamics. So, uh, Anella, are you uh, ready to pre present your slides? Yes, thank you, Michael. Okay, good morning to everyone. I'm glad to virtually meet you again. In the next uh, one hour, I'm going to introduce you to the main ideas of the molecular dynamics method, uh, to what the meaning of this method is, is to, uh, to the underlying theory, and to the um, main concepts related to its implementation, uh, so that we can do biomolecular simulations uh, with molecular dynamics. Since most of you marked during the registration that either they have no experience with molecular dynamics or basic or intermediate, I'm really going to try to stick to the basics of the method. And uh, for those of you who would like to have a more advanced discussion, I hope that we will be able to do that at the end of the lecture during the time for questions. Uh, now I think I'm going to switch off the camera so that we don't uh, put additional load on the connection. And then I'm going to share the screen. If for some reason you don't hear me or don't see the presentation, Michael, please tell me. Okay. So. I guess you should be able to see the screen now. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Then, before actually starting with the method of molecular dynamics, uh, I will introduce several concepts that will be needed uh, or are inevitably needed uh, to understand how molecular dynamics simulation functions. Uh, I would like to start with um, answering the question uh, why, what can we gain from a molecular dynamics biosimulation? Uh, well, here is just a list of uh, the information we can gain from performing such a simulation on uh, bioactive systems. Uh, for example, if we are interested uh, in what is the shape and the size of a biomacromolecule, being it a protein, being a some uh, membrane assembly of lipids uh, or a DNA fragment or an RNA or some other supramolecular assembly, uh, we can learn from the molecular dynamic simulation what is the shape and size of this uh, biomacromolecule. And uh, it's a very special focus on the natural environment. I'm going to talk more about that later during the lecture. If we want to know how biomolecules aggregate, uh, for example, we want to deliver drugs in the human organism. Usually, nowadays, this is done by uh, some uh, aggregating the drugs inside a biocompatible carrier. So this can be uh, also investigated by molecular dynamics. What are the characteristics times of formation, shape, and the lifetime of aggregates? This also can be answered in a way by uh, and the simulations. Or very often we would like to know how strong does a drug bind to a macromolecule, uh, very often to a protein, to an enzyme, or some other a transport uh, macromolecule, uh, in, in order to judge whether this drug will be able to replace the natural substrate of the macromolecule. Uh, and then uh, this again can be investigated by molecular dynamics. Or how can a drug traverse the cell membrane to enter the cell and do its job inside the, uh, the cell? This also can be studied by molecular dynamics. Uh, rate and conditions for conformational transitions of uh, 
bio macromolecules is all these are also important uh, aspects that uh, reveal the mechanisms of functioning of these macromolecules in the organisms uh, what are the the magnitude and the nature of the forces acting on the system of uh, interest for us uh, what is the supramolecular structure of biopolymers? How is it related to their function? You know that it is very important. Uh, the supramolecular structure is deterministic of whether the biological function of a certain biomolecule will be displayed or not. And uh, last year in the list, but not least, uh, we are very much interested, as uh, Professor Ducinova was talking uh, yesterday, in the bioactivity or potential bioactivity of new compounds that may be used as drugs or as some um, uh, have uh, other uh, bio, bio functions. So this also can be uh, information to this end can also be obtained from uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Of course, this is uh, by far not everything that we can do with MD, there is many more. Um, nowadays, uh, this method is becoming more and more popular, and it um, starts to be one of the irreplaceable tools uh, in the toolbox when uh, studying uh, biologically active systems and when doing um, research in this direction. So I guess with this, I was able to convince you that it's an important method. Uh, what we, when we start planning a molecular dynamics simulation, uh, we should always uh, think about several factors that might influence the setup, the carrying out, and the outcome of such a simulation. Uh, first, we have to think what are the characteristic times of the processes that we would like to observe. Just uh, briefly to summarize the previous slide, with molecular dynamics, we are actually monitoring the natural motion of molecules in, in very often liquid environment, uh, or in the presence of ions, or whatever uh, it is uh, they are embedded in, uh, in the organism. So these movements of the molecules, they happen at different time scale. And it is important to think in advance, what is the time scale that we would like to achieve? Here I have put um, a um, um, vector, so to say, showing uh, the increase in times and some of the bioprocesses that correspond to them. The fastest ones uh, of the order of uh, femtoseconds are the vibrations of the bond length in the molecules. All the atoms move, they vibrate, and this happens within femtoseconds. Femtoseconds, this is a very fast process. Then uh, conformations of molecules are generated by rotation about, uh, about uh, covalent bonds, uh, which should typically take about uh, picoseconds. Then we go to the slower processes. For example, if we would like to observe tra a transport of a small molecule or ions, in an ion channel across the cell membrane, or a lipid molecule rotating in a liquid medium, or the water relaxing around the biomolecule, this would normally take of the order of nanoseconds. Uh, so slower. Uh, even the smallest protein uh, would fold, would attain their uh, spatial structure quite, quite slowly uh, of the order of some microseconds. And here's where this arrow ends, because nowadays, if we would like to have atomistic detail with a molecular dynamic simulations, this is about the, um, la, la, the slowest time scale that we could achieve of the order of tens of microseconds with the computing power that was demonstrated to you yesterday. If we would like to take a look at uh, slower phenomena, like uh, the folding of so-called normal proteins, which are rather large, then we, it may take uh, up to milliseconds. If uh, we would like to monitor the synthesis of proteins in the ribosome, these are already very, very slow processes, uh, taking uh, times of the order of seconds. And uh, if we would like to observe uh, biochemical reactions or a protein folding in 
inside the cell membrane. This is already the domain of biology and it may take uh, up to days. What can we do if we would like to observe such processes by uh, in molecular dynamic simulations? Well, it's a bit tricky. Uh, we can uh, do the so-called coarse graining of our models. This means uh, we have different level of complexity or of detail of the molecular model themselves. The so-called full fully atomistic or uh, all atom models, there we uh, treat separately each atom in the molecule as chemists and are used to doing this. However, it is also possible to uh, unite several atoms in one particle, in one effective particle, which is called a bead. This process is uh, termed coarse graining and then we can treat this effective particle as the center which interacts with the other subcenters. Okay, you can um, visualize this most easily by uh, taking a protein. Proteins are very well bound by uh, amino acids. They are formed by amino acids bound in a certain way. Each amino acid contains a number of atoms. But we can imagine that, uh, okay, the, the structural detail is not so important and we can treat the whole amino acid residue as one particle, one bit. So this is uh, a level of coarse grain. Of course, uh, we say that by coarse graining, you uh, usually decrease the resolution uh, of your results. So you will not be able to see uh, the atomistic details, but you can observe uh, in this way a uh, slower phenomena. Even further, we can give up all molecular representations. So we can say, I don't need discrete molecules in my model. I can describe their phenomena, the, the phenomena happening therein uh, with a mathematical function. These are called mesoscopic simulations. And using them, you can also observe phenomena from the realm of biology. So this is uh, you, something you have to decide. What is the time scale? And if you are uh, willing to describe faster phenomena, then you may be um, remain with the atomistic detail models. If you are willing to describe slower phenomena, then you might need to course grain at a certain level. Your system. The two are always uh, related. Also, the time scale of the process. Okay, I have a big system, but I'm interested only in the conformations of some side protein side chains, which are on the surface and they rotate fast. So I can stay with the optimistic uh, uh, model, but just do short simulation. So that's uh, how you uh, usually make these decisions. What kind of model to treat? The rule of thumb here is that the slow phenomena usually require, require long simulations and or maybe sometimes both simplified models. Okay. Um, Professor, before we continue, um, yeah. sorry for interrupting, there's a little uh, text box that keeps appearing and disappearing that says, please move this window away, which is about uh, a little way from sorry, the top I of the screen. But how can I get rid of it? Maybe I can share the screen by sharing the. Okay. Hang on. Uh, by, um, yeah, the, the, there's still there's still that little slideshow. window. Yeah. Okay. Let me try like this. Here is the slideshow, and then I stopped the sharing and I repeated. Mm, yeah, you might have a. There might be a little window somewhere that you've got open that's sort yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. It happened to me also yesterday, but I couldn't find out the source of this. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, share. Yeah. Now? I think it's gone. Ah, ah, okay, it's gone. Right? Excellent. Okay. Okay, we can go on. Thank you, Mark. No problem. Okay, then one more classification, uh, which we have to introduce before because it's another decision you have to make when you start the simulation. 
uh, the computational methods that can be combined with uh, molecular dynamics may be divided in two main classes. The classical methods, uh, they use the laws of uh, classical mechanics to describe the motion of molecules. The so-called molecular mechanics, force fields, I'm going to talk about them in a minute a little bit more. Uh, the advantage uh, of these uh, classical methods, okay, let me first say what they mean. Uh, a classical method is uh, a method that neglects the quantum, the discrete quantum structure of atoms. So if you have a carbon atom, it will just be a particle, a bead, interacting with the other uh, particles in the system. Uh, what, what is the advantage of such um, simplification? Uh, you can treat quite la large models. I have written here up to 1 million atoms, but nowadays people are already starting to look at uh, models up to, let's say, 5, 6, uh, 10 million atoms uh, would be on, a, on an HPC system. Of course, if you are treating an event that relies on the quantum um, events that can happen in your system, for example, if you need to describe tunneling, you cannot, you cannot use such classical methods, but fortunately, biological systems, they obey more or less the laws of classical mechanics. And usually we are interested in phenomena that can be treated with this approach. So from now on in the lecture, I'm going to focus on this class of methods. Just to mention the other, to mention the other ones, the quantum methods, there uh, the discrete structure of the atom is taken into account. Uh, this means, of course, the nucleus is treated as a classical particle charged being there in the middle of the atom, but the quantum properties of the electrons are taken into account. You can also do that with molecular dynamics, but uh, these are somewhat different implementations. Uh, we are not going to talk about them today. What would be the a limitation of some of such quantum molecular dynamic simulations. I have put here up to 500 atoms, but maybe up to 1000 will be feasible on a supercomputer. So here again, one has to decide, I want a big model. I want my protein in water with ions, then I will have to stick with classical methods. Or I want to see very precisely how this drug molecule binds to an enzyme uh, active site and I want to especially monitor the uh, spin properties of this uh, ligand protein complex, then I have to do quantum dynamics. Okay, uh, so we have made this decision. We are going on with the classical approach. Then this is a very important uh, picture to put in your hand, uh, in your head. The concept of the potential energy surface, I guess you are all familiar with this, but nevertheless, I'm going to just introduce the terms that I'm going to use later on. So the potential energy surface is the surface that the molecules travel along when they move by their natural movements, by the thermal fluctuations, by the kinetic energy they possess at a certain temperature. So this potential energy surface represents the energy of a system as a function of its structure. By changing the structure of the molecules or of every super, supramolecular assembly, we inevitably uh, change the energy of the system. And we uh, are usually interested in stationary points along this uh, potential energy surface. So there are a lot of minima on the uh, potential energy surface, a lot of maxima, and the molecules can move between these minima by crossing certain energy barriers. So by moving through uh, some maxima. Usually uh, the minima are the target points of uh, especially biomolecular simulations because the minima are where stable structures actually are formed. And most of the time the structures will have will be like this. Uh, they will correspond to minima on the potential energy surface. You have here an example of protein that has two minima and uh, well, even a third one here 
where it is uh, completely, almost completely unfolded. And uh, of course, uh, this is a very simplified representation of a potential energy uh, surface of a protein. They are usually much, much more complex with many such minima uh, separated by barriers of different kinds. In this case, uh, okay, every potential energy surface has the so-called global minimum. So it is the state, the structure, to which uh, a minimum minimum energy corresponds. In our case, the most stable conformer of this protein is the conformer N. So this is the global uh, minimum on our potential energy surface. I would like to reveal even at this point that the molecular dynamics method is devised in such a way as to be able to naturally visit such minima on the potential energy surface. So you will get the so-called sampling of the potential energy surface, which means that you will get an ensemble is minimum of the image. Okay, so we need this, the potential energy surface, uh, because the molecules are moving all over it. Well, depending on the heights of the barriers and on the conditions, uh, I mean, temperature, pressure, and so on, uh, where the molecules are. Now, a couple of words more about the, the molecular mechanics method. This is a method which uh, is used to describe molecules using the laws of classical physics or classical mechanics. That is why it is called molecular mechanics. Uh, in, within this method, we represent molecules as a system of bound mechanical objects. So the atoms are these bits that I was talking about, and they are bound. We know that in reality, they are bound by covalent bonds. But within the method of molecular mechanics, bonds are represented as, um, let's say, springs. So you can imagine that the vibration of the bond is actually these uh, two uh, beads here attached to a string uh, of a different strength, strength and this spring ca can uh, deviate from its uh, equilibrium position, but it always returns to this most preferred bond length to the equilibrium position. Uh, we represent the vibration of the angles in a similar way. Way we represent the torsion potentials with the classical expression uh, because we need to be able to describe different conformations of the molecules. Then we, uh, of course, uh, in biomolecules, uh, there are also the so called non bonded interactions, the most important among them being the electrostatics. This is the interaction between differently charged particles, and of course, the van der Waals interactions, the dispersion. Uh, so at the end, we may assign uh, a kind of classical mechanical function to describe each of these interactions in the molecules. And when the molecules are moving, there will be a contribution from all these movements to the potential energy of the system. The combination of the type of mathematical functions that we are using to describe all these interactions and some parameters i'm going to explain in a minute what these parameters are actually provides the total potential energy of the system so if we know this number the potential energy for different structures we can construct the potential energy surface of our system biomolecular mechanics force field so the combination of the type of potential potentials and parameters is called a force field. Force fields are derived by different research groups and therefore uh, there are different uh, force fields which exist in the literature and which uh, people are using. I have listed here uh, some abbreviations. Usually these force fields, they have abbreviations uh, and that's how they are known. Uh, I have listed just a couple of them. There are many tens of force fields, or I don't know how many, but here we will uh, briefly focus in a minute only on the most popular ones, which are atomistic. I'm not going to talk about the uh, force strength uh, models from now on, 
and which are often used for biosimulation. Okay, so let me just illustrate what are the uh, type of mathematical functions that are most often used to describe these different uh, movements that uh, motions that can happen within molecules. For the stretching of bonds, of course, it's uh, very convenient to use the harmonic potential. So we have the string, we have its strength, described here by the force constant. We have the equilibrium bond length, which is L0. And this means that this bond can vibrate within this harmonic potential. Uh, for the angles, the same approach. Usually a harmonic potential is used just with a smaller uh, force constants because uh, uh, angles can often more open more easily than um, bonds. Uh, usually this potential is um, symmetric or periodic. That is why a periodic function is usually employed to describe the energy uh, change upon rotation about covalent bonds. We have here the height of this barrier, we have the uh, equilibrium angle, and we have the number of the minima along this uh, torsional potential. To describe electrostatic interactions, there is no surprise. Uh, usually the Coulomb law is used uh, where we uh, assign here some partial charges to the atoms in our system. And of course, the electrostatic energy is inversely proportional to the distance between these particles and to the and proportional to the magnitude and sign of their charges. And for the van der Waals interactions, the dispersion, uh, there is a very popular potential, the Leonard Jones potential, probably you know it, uh, which has a, an attractive uh, part and a repulsion part when the particles are too close together. So they, they don't merge. So this is uh, actually a representative form of a force field. Uh, but you see some things are circled here. These are the so-called parameters. These are numerical values that we need to take from somewhere in order to be able to calculate the uh, uh, separate energy contributions. So how are these parameters derived? We say usually these values are uh, derived in a way as to be able to represent the experiment, a set of experimental data for a certain series of molecules. These molecules are used to parameterize the force field. That is how we say it. So these are numbers and putting in all those numbers guarantees that when we obtain the energies, we will, they will be able to represent the experimental behavior, the experimental properties that were used to derive these parameters. What kind of experimental data are used? Different, uh, most many structural parameters taken from X-ray, NMR or whatever experimental method you have. Then um, mm, uh, some thermodynamic parameters, uh, density, enthalpy, and so on. And uh, some of these values cannot always be secured by experimental measurements. For example, the energy barriers for conformational transitions. Then usually high level quantum chemical calculations are performed to ensure the data for these parameters. Also the charges on the atoms, they are not uh, directly experimentally measurable. So they are uh, generated from quantum chemical calculations. That is how we end up with the force field. We have chosen the potential functions and we have the parameters. This is something that the user usually doesn't do, but uh, the force field is ready. The parameters are already introduced as libraries in the software package, but you should know what the force field is and how it looks like because sometimes some of the parameters are missing. And then it is the task of the, of the user to provide these parameters. Therefore, I'm just going to briefly show you uh, the uh, potential functions and just mention 
in, in a second, the three most popular atomistic force fields that are used for biosimulations. Uh, well, the father of all biomolecular force fields is AMBER. Uh, it uh, is developed by some scientists at Cornell University in the United States. And uh, originally it was developed, so this is very important to remember for the force fields. Depending on what kind of compounds were used to derive their parameters, they are suitable for describing the same or similar classes of compounds. You cannot uh, use AMBER, for example, describe metal complexes. It is not suitable for that because it, it was devised for proteins and nucleic acids. And from uh, version 95 on, AMBER is also appropriate for small organic molecules like, uh, for example, the drugs. They also have a version for carbohydrates and another version for small organic molecules. So it is very, very, very popular for biosimulations. Then we go to CHARM. Uh, it's also quite um, often frequently used for biosimulations. Uh, they have focused more on uh, parameters for lipids. So if you would like to simulate the a lipid membrane, then CHARM would be your best choice. It works okay for proteins and also it can be used for nucleic acids. Uh, again, it is developed in the University of Maryland, mostly in the United States. And uh, the third one that is gaining more and more popularity for biosimulations um, now during the last uh, maybe five, six years is the OPLS. It was originally derived based on AMBAR to describe proteins and organic liquids. This is a specificity of OPLS. If you need properties of liquids, then it would be a good idea to use it. And uh, recently, they also provide a very decent parameter set for description of lipids. It's developed in the group of Jorgensen at Yale University, again in the United States. Of course, there are other force fields. You can read the literature and you can make a choice of your own. I'm just mentioning the most popular ones. Okay, <clears throat> just sorry. <coughs> it is important uh, uh, to say a couple of words about the environment. <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> just a second. Because bioprocesses, they usually don't take place in vacuum, in the gas phase, but in an explicit, in a, a liquid environment. So it is very important to include explicitly with the solvent molecules, uh, uh, also this environment in the calculations. You will hear more details about that. Uh, also during the training of how can this be done and what is important to obey. Uh, of course, the most natural environment in the living organism is water. So usually we put at least water uh, surrounding the biomolecules that we are modeling. There are also force fields that, that are derived especially for water. And maybe the most popular among, among them is the so-called water model, CIP3P. There, each atom in the water molecule is a separate particle interacting with the other particles around. So you have to choose the appropriate force field also for water. And uh, okay, so now we have our biomolecule, we have surrounded it, so for example, with solvent molecules, and uh, we have put it in such a cubicle compartment, for example. However, at the uh, walls of the compartment, the particles that are interacting, they feel uh, or they have different forces then the particles that are in the center of this cubicle compartment, this is called the simulation box. So in order to eliminate this, uh, the so-called finite side effects, they can cause artifacts in our simulation. For example, if you have charged particles in the system moving, then uh, the, the particles with opposite charges will try to stay uh, with the uh, same charges 
will try to stay as far apart as, as possible in the box. It's, a, it's an artifact that is not what happens in nature. That's why usually biosimulations are done in the so-called periodic boundary conditions. What does it mean? You take your simulation box and this provides you with a continuous solution or, or solid. It depends on what you would like to simulate. It eliminates the finite size effects and it provides you with a more realistic model that you can uh, describe. Okay, good. Now we have the periodic boundary conditions. We have all molecules inside. For example, this is a part of a liquid bilayer with some proteins embedded into it. This is a DNA fragment with a solvent, water solvent, and some counter ions, sodium chloride. Um, that is normally how uh, the resulting models look like. But the sizes nowadays are 10 to the power of 5, 10 to the power of 6 atoms. So these are quite large models. And uh, their potential energy surface will be rather complex. Uh, it will have many such minima, many such maxima, uh, separated in the minima with different uh, barrier heights. So we need some statistical approach to be able to visit, to sample the potential energy surface properly. So to have structures uh, that correspond to the different minima on this complex potential energy surface. That is why we need an approach from statistical mechanics. And this approach in our case will be the molecular dynamics methods. But before we go to the method, I very briefly will mention, so we always have a lot of particles in the model. Uh, then we have to do statistics on them. Uh, so so we have to use the approaches of statistical thermodynamics. This automatically leads to another decision that you have to make, which ensemble of statistical mechanics you would like to simulate in. And here are the two most um, popular uh, statistical ensembles uh, that are used for biosimulations, the so-called canonical ensemble, and here are the quantities that are kept constant or have constant average value in such an ensemble. This is the number of particles, the volume of the system, and the temperature. Uh, okay, some of the biochemical reactions maybe take place in such an ensemble, but they are not a lot. Most of the biochemical processes actually happen in such conditions, in the so-called isobaric isothermal ensemble, where the number of particles, the pressure, and the temperature are maintained uh, with constant uh, constant. So this is actually the most popular ensemble for biomolecular simulations, but again, you have to think what kind of process you're interested in, in which conditions it takes place, and then choose the appropriate ensemble. So this was the introductory part, and uh, actually we can now set up a, a scheme of a classical biomolecular simulation. At the first step, we select our level of detail, either an optimistic or a simple simplified coarse grained approach. Then we select the force field, which one is the most appropriate for our system. Then uh, this is the other general method for performing statistical mechanical simulations, the Monte Carlo, but we are not going to talk about it today. Uh, most of the biosimulations are done by molecular dynamics. Then we have set up our model, chosen our method. We perform the simulation. And as a result of this simulation, we get the so-called, let's say, molecular dynamics trajectory. This trajectory is a file, and this file contains an ensemble of structures that are, let's say, a representation of sampling from uh, our potential energy surface. These are usually a lot of structures, uh, several hundred thousands normally. So we have to process this significant amount of data somehow. This is usually done by performing statistical analysis on these trajectory files. There from we can extract the necessary uh, physical properties of our system. We can average them. We can do uh, different processing. 
And finally, we can do some conclusions about the properties of our system. What do we use these properties for? We can compare to experimental data to assist, for example, interpretation of some complex experimental data. We can explain some experimental phenomena, or we can be even bolder and predict some new properties that were not known for these systems so far. And now, finally, we start uh, introducing the method of molecular dynamics itself. Uh, okay, what is the essence of the method? Nothing special about it. The method of molecular dynamics uh, is a solution of the classical equations of Newton, uh, the equations of motion, they are called. Uh, and this is uh, the very familiar second Newton's law. Uh, which relates to the force acting on a particle, the force acting on a particle to the acceleration of this particle. So as long as we know the force, uh, it is automatically accelerated following the second law of Newton and it starts moving. But how do we know the force? We can calcu calculate the force as a derivative of the potential energy uh, with respect to the coordinates of these particles in our system. Uh, where do we have the potential energy from? From the force field. So this is the basics of the method. It sounds very simple, but as you will see on the next slide, the implementation is not that simple. And there are several things that we need to consider. Then uh, solving sequentially these equations of motion, we can monitor the movement of the particles in our system. Uh, over a certain time period, and we can record uh, at some time intervals uh, the data in a trajectory file, which we then process. What would be the accessible time periods for uh, current and these simulations? The atomistic, normally up to five microseconds, the coarse grain, normally up to 20, 50 microseconds, and the microscopic can go up to one millisecond. How do we perform a molecular dynamic simulation? There are several stages that we have to um, follow. First, we do the so-called energy minimization of the initial configuration. The initial configuration is the initial structure of our system. Uh, you will hear more about that in the next lecture and in the practical training. Uh, but somehow, in a graphical program, for example, you have generated the initial structure of your model. You have put it in a periodic box and applied periodic boundary conditions. Then you do the energy minimization. This is required in order to, uh, to eliminate some unnatural uh, repulsive forces and to uh, take your system to the nearest energy minimum on the potential energy system uh, surface. Then you hit the system. This means you assign uh, velocities to the particles that correspond to a certain temperature. This is done gradually. Uh, you will hear about it more again in the next lecture. Then you equilibrate your system in the chosen statistical ensemble. Since we are following the natural laws of Newton, if you just leave your system in the chosen statistical ensemble, it will inevitably reach equilibrium. So this is the equilibration state. All the these three stages, they are preparatory for your simulation. Then you start the actual uh, accumulation of configurations of low energy structures by calculating the forces and then solving the equations of motion. This propagates the system in a certain direction. Then you record the snapshot and then you do it again and again and again many times until you are satisfied with the time period you have. And then you stop the simulation and you start the statistical processing of the recorded configurations. Something that is important as a check whether your simulation is, um, is doing well, uh, you have to know that energy and momentum of the system are conserved during the simulation. So you may monitor the energy and sometimes the velocities, but very rarely, to check that everything is fine. There should be no drift in the energy of your simulation. Okay, the, the equations of motion on the previous slide, they look very simple, but in fact, they are um, differential, second order differential 
to equations, which are very, very complex for such large systems, which um, necessitates numerical solution of these equations of motion. And here is a very brief presentation of the approach that is used to integrate uh, these equations of motion. The most popular algorithm, these algorithms are for numerical solution of the equations of motion are usually called integrators. And the most popular maybe in for biosimulations is the so-called leapfrog algorithm. It relies on a Taylor series expansion of the coordinates of the particles uh, around a certain time by adding small time increments. So this is an important parameter in, in these simulations. It's called the time step. It's usually a very small number because it's a, the Taylor expansion should be valid uh, of the order of one to two femtoseconds. Then the new positions are generated from the velocities at the half step ahead and from the current coordinates. Uh, the velocities at half step ahead, we calculate from the velocities of the particles at one half step before, and from the current forces acting on the particles that we have calculated from the potential energy. And then we also have the velocities at the current time step by simple average of uh, the velocities at half step before and after the current moment. So. I'm not going to go into details about that, but it's a robust uh, algorithm. It's reversible in time. Uh, and the drawback is that it's a bit weird the way the velocities are calculated on the particles. So there is some improvement with the so-called velocity valley algorithm, where uh, it is considered to be maybe the most uh, stable and uh, reliable integrator of the equations of motion. Uh, on these very late series. Uh, here you have all the coordinates and the velocities and the forces at the same time uh, step finally saved. This is the advantage. The disadvantage is that it needs a little bit more storage. Okay, but so far we have, uh, we know how to integrate the equations of motion. But uh, this is uh, not the canonical, neither the canonical, not the isothermic isobaric ensemble. So we now need to um, extend the equations of motion with the so-called thermostats. The thermostats are algorithms which allow uh, maintaining constant uh, average temperature in our system. So you can imagine it as coupling the system to a heat path as it is done in thermodynamics. I'm not going to go into detail about this uh, formula, about how the equations of motion exactly are extended. I'm just mentioning here the most popular algorithms uh, that are used for maintaining constant temperature. So one of them is the parent thermostat. It's very robust, it's very stable, it can always uh, bring your system into equilibrium in the canonical ensemble, whatever your initial structure you start from. Uh, but it has the main drawback that it does not sample properly from the canonical thermodynamic ensemble. Nevertheless, for biosimulations, people are using it all the time, and it has pro been proven over numerous simulations that there are no problems with the structure generated using the balance and thermostat. Uh, there is a, a, an implementation in, in Gromax that uh, corrects this problem with the sampling, and it is called the very scale thermostat. If you would like to be very, very uh, thermodynamically correct, then you can use the so called Nusekovar thermostat, which is a different approach of correcting the equations of motion. In order to maintain constant pressure in the system, uh, then uh, this is done by uh, allowing the volume of our periodic box to fluctuate. So it resembles a virtual piston acting on our system, which can maintain the average constant pressure. Again, one of the most popular bar stats is the Berenson algorithm. Uh, very simple, very robust, 
it's usually used to equilibrate your system to bring it into equilibrium before you start sampling before you start the so-called production part of the simulation again it doesn't sample exactly the isobaric isothermic ensemble so if you want to be very correct you can use this parimel or ramandar stuff which is also available in the gromax package and not only in the gromax in most of the packages so we need to now uh, talk about some specifics relating to speeding up the, uh, the simulation up to this level all the basics are set you choose your system you choose your force field you choose the periodic boundary conditions you choose uh, the thermostat and barostat you choose your time step you choose the length of the simulation and your rate however if you have a million atoms in your model then uh, it will be quite hmm, time consuming to do the calculations and there are several techniques to speed up these calculations i'm just very briefly going to mention those first of all we can apply a cutoff to our potential energy for example if we have one particle here and one particle very far from it it is for sure the, the interaction energy between them is zero so why calculating it it takes a lot of computer time so we can impose a cutoff on the potential just check the distance between the particles and if it exceeds a certain value the cutoff then we can just skip the calculation of the potential energy and the, the forces which is very time consuming uh, this is done usually values of the order of one 1.2 nanometers are assigned as the limiting uh, interatomic distance beyond which the potential energy is not calculated and here i have shown different techniques by which you can smoothly um, zero uh, or smoothly make the potential energy go to zero uh, usually this is recommended to avoid some artifacts in the simulation okay but in order to impose the cutoff you need to check all your particles in the system to decide which fall inside the cutoff and which fall outside the cutoff this is also a slow process so in order to speed it up uh, there is uh, the so-called valet technique suggested by valet uh, so you don't check all particles in the system you check particles that fall inside a sphere that is a bit larger than the cutoff usually by 0.2 two nanometers larger uh, radius then you make a list of all those particles that are inside this valley sphere and you have your neighbor lists these are the neighbors that you need to calculate the uh, intermolecular interactions for or interparticle interactions for there is also another approach where you can you you just split your periodic box into such cells you sort them by a certain thing coordinates or whatever and uh, you uh, list your particles according to these uh, cells so this beats the calculations very, very much uh, one more thing okay i have one particle here and if i need to calculate uh, the interactions of this particle with all the other particles it's uh, again slow so the so-called minimum image convention is used i calculate the interactions of this particle only with its closest neighbors either in its actual box or the so-called periodic images i forgot to mention that whenever a particle leaves the box it enters from the other side so we uh, keep the end condition the number of particles constant in our system so particle one will interact with particle two and with the image of particle five with the image of particle four and with the image of particle three this also saves a lot of time during the calculation of the force okay by imposing this cutoff we however lose part of the energy we can never be exactly sure when the energy uh, becomes zero for all particle pairs in our system if we think that this loss is big for the van der Waals energy for the dispersion interactions we can do the so-called long-range correction 
So we calculate the potential energy up to the cutoff exactly using the force field. And we do such a integration to uh, estimate the long range part of the uh, Van der Waals energy uh, just by using the so-called radial distribution function. It's a specific uh, analysis that can be done on our system. Okay, it's in part of the Van der Waals energy, but it is for sure not enough to compensate the missing part of the electrostatic energy because the electrostatic interaction is so long range. So a particle here can still feel electrostatically the particle here because the dependence is one over R, the distance between the particles. To compensate for this, for the missing part of the uh, electrostatic energy beyond the cutoff, uh, there is a special scheme called the particle mesh level based on the method suggested by Evo to treat the electrostatic interactions in crystals. I'm not going to go into detail, just uh, I'm going to tell you that there is uh, um, the electrostatic energy is split into three contributions. The direct one, which is just the Coulomb law applied directly up to the cutoff we have imposed on the potential. Then the long range part, which is calculated in uh, the Fourier space, in inverse space, so to say, minus some uh, non-physical self-interaction, which is subtracted from the energy at the end. This is also speeded up by assigning uh, charges, not taking the real charges of the atoms, but uh, uh, dividing them on the um, nodes of a regular mesh. That is why particle mesh. Uh, and uh, this speeds up very much the procedure in the Fourier space and allows you to calculate uh, the long range part of the electrostatic energy in a decent way. Just some final notes before we go to the end. Uh, in biosimulations, it is quite often that we would like to impose the so-called restraints or constraints on some parts of our model system. For example, we take a protein, we know its crystal structure, uh, and then we would like to keep the crystal structure as it is. Oh, but we would like to see how water molecules assemble around the protein or how ions assemble around the protein or how ligands bind to this protein structure. Then we may impose a restraint on the atoms of the protein. What is this? We just uh, impose an additional harmonic potential that uh, forces the atoms of the protein to not to move, to keep their positions fixed during the MD simulations. This is achieved by uh, here setting up uh, a big force constant of the harmonic potential. These are the so-called restraints. We decide whether to involve them or not. There are also, however, the so-called polynomial constraints. Sometimes, uh, not sometimes, the size of our time step in the integrator is limited by the frequency of the fastest vibration in our system. Usually the fastest vibrations are the ones of the hydrogen containing bonds. Okay, but there is not, nothing much interesting in the vibration of the hydrogen. Uh, containing bonds. And that's why we can use these algorithms to constrain the bond length to their initially defined length. Not all of them. We may constrain only the hydrogen con containing bond length. The most popular media algorithm is called shape. And the essence of this method is to add an additional force, uh, which is uh, along the direction of the bond. and counteracts exactly the deformation force along this bond. So by adding the two forces, just the bonds are constrained to their initial bond length. This is the essence of the method. And uh, okay, now we know how to do the simulations. We can make some choices, reasonable ones. We have the trajectory. Uh, it contains a lot of data. So what can we extract from an MD project? 
Here I have just grouped the main types of analysis that can be done. So we can extract average values and structural parameters, thermodynamic properties, whatever you can think of. Uh, there are some physical properties that are also related to the standard deviations of the quantities that we have in our uh, trajectory or to the fluctuations of these quantities, for example, the heat capacities. We can generate the so-called radial distribution functions uh, by counting the number of particles of type A and type B and what is the preferred distance they are located at. This is in the essence the radial distribution function. Uh, this is a typical profile for a liquid. From this profile of the radial distribution function, we can judge how the molecules or the atoms are structured in our uh, uh, system. This is a typical profile for a liquid where the first neighbors are here at this preferred distance and the second neighbors are here and maybe some third neighbors. We can do cluster analysis. This is group representative structures that look alike and uh, extract in this way, the preferred structure of our biomolecule. Uh, we can uh, do correlation functions. This is um, an analysis that allows us to track, I would say, the memory of our system, whether a certain property B depends on another property A at a different time period. These are very powerful analyses. I have no time to go into detail, but you can uh, identify if there are some periodic uh, processes in your system. And uh, we can also estimate transport coefficients, like, for example, the diffusion coefficient. If we would like to see how fast our molecule is moving in the medium, we can estimate this diffusion coefficient. And many more, just to, get you, to give you an idea. So at the end, some advantages and some drawbacks of the method. Uh, I hope I was able to convince you that it's a very powerful technique uh, with which you can monitor the natural behavior of different size and complexity systems. Uh, it may be parallelized efficiently because you can just split the atoms in chunk, in chunks and uh, send them the calculations to different cores. Uh, it can do both static and it can monitor both static and time dependent phenomena. It can be extended for some very non trivial uh, simulations for non equilibrium processes to monitor phase transitions or rare events to estimate the free energy, which you are going to listen to about on Thursday. It can be both classical and quantum. Of course, there are some drawbacks as well. Uh, it is a common problem with uh, complex potential energy surfaces that model systems may be stuck in a uh, deep local minimum. Then there are the so-called enhanced sampling, sampling techniques which are required to cross higher energy barriers. You might need to apply them. The storage requirements are enormous, tens to hundreds of terabytes for a single trajectory, uh, sorry, of gigabyte. Of course, uh, single trajectory are not uncommon. Uh, there is some tricky implementation of the QMMM methods. You are going to hear tomorrow how the colleagues from the Bearsbury lab overcome these obstacles. And energy related properties are not, not trivial to estimate. Molecular dynamics is very, very structure based uh, method, but uh, it's not impossible. You just need special techniques. Here are the facilities and the software packages. Of course, uh, the choice of the particular computational approach will depend on the properties you want to see and on the available computational resources. Usually, multi-core servers are needed to run such simulations. Here I have listed some of the more popular packages uh, that are used for molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, of course, we have to acknowledge the support of PRACE and of these four organizations for allowing us to accomplish this training. I hope it was in a way useful for you. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, of course to tell you that we 
we will be waiting for your the training and Q&A session in the afternoon. I'm sorry that I overstepped a little bit of time, but I think we have a break. So I will be happy to answer your questions if there are some. Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Lena. Um, yes, there are actually some questions. I mean, um, do, shall we go through them now or shall we, uh, or shall we wait until the afternoon? Uh, we could we could go through now because there's about sort of half a dozen or so questions. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I can. Should I read them from the chat? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I mean, I could, I could read them out for you actually because I've, I've been sort of taking, yeah, you know, sort of paying, yeah, you know, sort of looking through. Um, so, so, so the first so, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first question is about is from Mohammed. Uh, he's asking whether both whether we can combine. Um, uh, well, I think this, this was talking about the combining, say, a simple model for an amino acid and, uh, and a, you're on a finer grain sort of atomic level for sort of more interesting parts of a protein. Yeah, okay. It's an interesting question. Hmm. It, mm, yeah, <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> non trivial, far by, uh, it's by far not a trivial technique. Hmm. Uh, what people usually do in these cases is they uh, use hybrid methodology, not hybrid models. Hmm. So they, um, for example, treat this interesting part of the protein by quantum method. And then they uh, use, again, atomistic force fields to uh, describe the, um, the rest of the protein. Of course, you can combine this quantum method with the coarse grain force field, and then effectively to result in what you are asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that is the simplest answer to this question. It's a great good question. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so another the next question was from Daniel asking uh, how you know, uh, asking if you could comment on the accuracy of the uh, tip four the tip four P water model, whether it's sort of more accurate than tip three P. Yeah. Okay, it's another good question. Yes, <clears throat> the short answer is T4P is more accurate than T3P. But it, we come again to whether we would uh, invest more computational effort into gaining some accuracy. It depends very much on the property that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. T4P uh, has one in interaction site more, so it will add about 25% to the computational effort. Yeah. If you are just interested in the structure of your molecules, then it doesn't pay, from my experience at least. Mm. However, if you would like to uh, compute thermodynamic properties, like to have very accurate density of your system, or to have enthalpies, or to have uh, co how to say, uh, properties of entire of the entire system, collective properties, then it for be would pay for. It gives more accurate results. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then we've got F. Ben, ben Allen. I'm sorry, I don't know uh, your first name, but, uh, the, but they're asking, are there any specific recommendations for the use of solvent models according to the selected force field, or can any solvent model be used with any force field? Thank you very much for this question. I forgot to mention. Usually, force fields uh, for biosimulations are derived together with a certain or for a certain water model. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all three force fields that I was showing you, Amber, OPLS, and Charm, they recommend the authors of these force fields to use the TIP and P water models. So, mm -hmm. normally they were derived for TIP and P. But you can also use them. It's good to combine them also with the 4P. Yeah, you have to check. Usually in the papers of the force field, they recommend also the appropriate solvent model. Yeah. So, and then we've got a question from Pedro asking, are all finite size effects eliminated with periodic boundary conditions? Mm, yeah, usually yes. Uh, there are no edges in your system so particles can smoothly move across uh, box boundaries and there are no fine size, size effects in this uh, aspect. But of course your properties will be limited both by the size of the periodic box 
and uh, of the shape of the periodic box. Because the periodic box is uh, automatically replicated, this symmetry, the, the shape of the periodic box, will be imposed on your system. Yeah. And Sorry. also, if the, if the box is too small, uh, there still may be some artifacts. In order to be sure that your box is large enough, it is recommended that you uh, perform simulations with at least three gradually increasing sizes of the periodic box. Then you monitor one at least one of the properties that you would be interested in. And if you mm -hmm. don't see any change, then the box is big enough. Okay. Now that's 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 a that's a good answer actually. That's that's very good. Um, I mean, there was uh, a partner. A partner was asking mm. whether you could explain again about those finite mm. size defects. Um, but I think you can maybe probably... I answered. <laughs> but I think, okay. I think he might. I think he might have done yes. Yeah. Okay. And then and then F Bernard Bernard has got another question, which is how can one validate or measure the reliability of a molecular dynamics simulation? Okay, uh, that's also a very important question. But uh, I think you will hear more about that from. Dr. Petkov, who is going to be the next lecturer, just briefly, yeah. you always follow uh, track the energy. Mm -hmm. uh, just be sure that the energy is conserved. There is no drift upwards, downwards. Any drift in the equilibrium part of your simulation is bad. Mm -hmm. So either energy is leaking or there are some repulsive forces that should not be there. Uh, if you see such a thing, you have to see, you have to check what's going on. Uh, there are also several other properties that are usually monitored along your trajectory. If you are working in a NPT ensemble, then of course you, follow, you check the pressure and the temperature. They should fluctuate around stable average values and not just any average value, but the reference one that you have assigned. For example, you say I want to simulate the body temperature, then your average temperature should be 310 Kelvin. That's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to monitor at least one structural property uh, to see usually the structure relaxes more slowly than the energy in the thermodynamic properties. So you have to verify, for example, that the root mean square deviation of the coordinates of your atoms uh, with respect to the initial structure has reached also a steady fluctuation around uh, a certain average value. So these are the minimum set of properties that usually are checked to validate the reliability. Oh, that's great. 